Hello, and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, licensed professional counselor. In today's episode, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Dave Johnson, MD. Dr. Johnson and I will be discussing integrative cardiovascular medicine, preventative methods for mental health, and preventative methods for physical health. We're going to be discussing his deep dive into integrative medicine and his training, as well as his new clinic in Grand Rapids called Integrative Wellness Grand Rapids. Dr. Dave Johnson, cardiologist, believes that health is the result of learning to follow your own heart's path rather than suffering from it. Dr. Johnson is a board-certified cardiologist residing in West Michigan. And while he was contributing to the development of highly successful cardiac care programs in West Michigan, he also began to see the limitations of these systems. The foundations for health and healing are related to nutrition, physical activity, adequate rest, our thoughts and reactions to stress, and our interconnectedness or relationships with ourselves, others, and the natural world. This shortfall in the medical system led him to pursue change in his approach, not only for the benefit of his patients, but for him and his family as well. A true calling for change since he would have to leave some of the traditional medical model behind that he had helped build. In 2010, Dr. Dave Johnson completed a fellowship in integrative medicine at the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, which was founded by Dr. Andrew Weil. He has witnessed the transformative impact of looking deeper than just at the signs and symptoms of heart disease in order to address the root cause of the disease. First, in his own life, he has learned to follow his heart's path to explore new visions, even if they are not fully embraced by the status quo. Secondly, he has also witnessed the benefits of lifestyle change in his patients. This healing journey begins with this inward direction as we connect to our own authenticity or divine nature with all that surrounds us. While Dr. Johnson is formally trained in traditional Western medicine, he, he also wants to integrate other methods of healing. He attended medical school at Ohio State University and then internal medicine at the University of Iowa's hospitals and clinics and finally a cardiology fellowship at the University of Alabama. However, it was in the course of his own life's journey that he found connecting with the natural world opened his heart and empowered him to change direction to a more holistic approach in healthcare. And if you want to know more about Dr. Dave, check out his website and Integrative Wellness Grand Rapids and you can actually hear his TED Talk, which was recorded on March 15th, 2012, and you can see that on his website right now. But at the risk of giving too long of an introduction to this amazing doctor and person, I am just going to cut right to the interview while you are here about what Dr. Dave Johnson is up to right now. I hope you enjoy it. Welcoming to the show, Dr. Dave Johnson, MD. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Yes, I've uh, long awaited the time I could interview you, but you've been quite a busy doctor and guy for the last few years, and now we're finally getting the opportunity. Yeah, so this should be exciting. Looking forward to the conversation. Yes, and so um, so a little bit about you. I, I read your bio before this, and you talk about integrative cardiovascular medicine, and you are a cardiologist, board certified, so can you explain a little bit about what is integrative cardiovascular medicine. Yeah, I'd love to, but perhaps it makes the most sense to uh, explore how I um, came across the idea of integrative medicine through my own personal uh, story. I like that. Let's go with that. Okay, good, good. So I've been trained as a conventional cardiologist through many of the great medical centers, you know, across this country and, and really enjoyed working with some wonderful mentors and colleagues and helping patients manage their disease successfully. But over a course of about a decade of doing conventional cardiology, I found myself challenged with the fact that we seem to be continuing to have this ongoing battle against their disease while not necessarily attending to the health and well-being of the individual. You know, I knew about Dean Ornish's studies from the 1990s about lifestyle medicine and its benefits in reversing, you know, heart disease, especially the plaque buildup in your arteries, which is the most common form of heart disease. And yet in the healthcare systems that I've been involved with, there's very little attention being paid to that aspect of uh, clinical care. 
And so around 2008 or so, I decided to do my own exploration, and that's what led me to the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine, where I completed a two-year fellowship under his guidance and and, uh, Dr. Lodog, um, learning all about the principles of integrative medicine. Uh, It's much more patient-centered, much more holistic in its approach, and it's multidisciplinary, meaning that there is no single model of healthcare that um, has the unique capacity to serve all circumstances that an individual may be challenged with. And so that was a very eye-opening um, experience for me. Perhaps the not only experimenting with some of these practices like meditation, energy medicine, manual therapies like um, strain, counter-strain, and manipulation, but nutrition was really big, and, and um, it was my first opportunity to really explore stress management through uh, mindfulness meditation. Those two things, to me, resonated very well with where I was at and what I needed in my own personal life, as well as what I could provide the patients or clients that I was seeing. Excellent, yes. Um, so it sounds like you you went on this journey because what you were doing uh, as a doctor was basically just fighting this disease but you weren't perhaps having the opportunity very often to sit with the individual and try to find out how they could prevent themselves from actually ending up in your hospital or practice is that what i'm hearing yes there's a high um recidivism if you will recurrent rate of um interventions or escalation of medications in within most clinical practices that are in conventional medicine to date. It's the layering on of more or newer medications. And at the same time, you hear the frustrations of patients taking the number of pills that they're taking and the frustrations of cost of all these new drugs and their growing mistrust of a potential conflict of interest that they perceive physicians have with the pharmaceutical industry, even though that's not a real conflict of interest. Because as a physician, I never get kickbacks from the pharmaceutical industries by writing prescriptions. But patients perceive that. And and so there was a, what I appreciated was a um, diminishing trust uh, within that model of healthcare. And at the same time, I was uneasy, again, with not being able to provide patients the comprehensive health care that they need. You know, we were doing great, again, with disease management, but uh, optimizing health and well-being, that was a whole other missed opportunity, I think, in many circumstances. The patients that I did take care of that would listen to some of the comments I would make about eating healthier, moving more, managing stress, improving relationships. When they got it and they did it, it was amazing to see their transformation and their growing independence rather than dependence on the medical system. And that's, at the end of the day, what really drew me towards integrative medicine, a model that really restores the empowerment for individuals to manage their own care. There's a phrase that's used in some some areas of medicine where, you know, self care is becoming the new primary care, and I re- that really resonated with me because so much of what we treat in modern medicine today is either preventable and possibly reversible at the same time. Yeah, I don't know the statistic, but I was reading uh, a story on one of the major news channels that said most of the top five or six causes of death in the United States were preventable diseases or like five of six or something like that. Most of it being heart health and weight and diabetes and uh, suicide, something else. Yeah, absolutely. And and if you look at uh, data about heart attacks, I mean, you can, there's plenty of data out there now that support it. 70 to 90% of heart attacks can be completely avoided through lifestyle and behavioral modifications. Wow. The leading so, cause of death of Americans, preventable. Wow. And so uh, the hard part is, is that the reason, there's many reasons people may not want to change what they're doing. And there's a lot of 
incentives not to change. And I think that comes from, you mentioned uh, in another conversation with me, the cultural normative situation that people find themselves Mm -hmm. in may actually lead them to make choices that are very unhealthy um, for their overall lifestyle for the long term. Yeah, I think by and large, people are aware of what healthier lifestyles can do. But they may not be as aware of how dramatically changed our lifestyle has become over the last 50 to 70 years, you know, and, you know, from being more sedentary to eating a much more processed, toxic laden diet, you know, to exposure to environmental toxins, to rapid change causing increasing psychosocial stress, emotional overwhelmment. All those processes are contributing to the physical ailments that we see as medical doctors every day. And as a cardiologist, I'd like to say that's probably the leading cause of having a broken heart is not so much a physical phenomenon as much as it is might be an emotional, behavioral component. Yeah, so... What are, um, you know, I know that you say people are sort of aware of it, but it, it seems like in America, not everywhere, but there's a big cultural component that sort of likes to embrace unhealthy on, on purpose, yeah. like sort of uh, as a badge of courage to say, well, you only live once, you might as well eat this triple bacon cheeseburger with a shake and mm-hmm. fries and don't sleep and drink five hour energy. There's sort of a... Uh, something where people sort of take that on as a sort of a masculine, I I don't want to say masculine, that's not all men, but um, sort of like this courageous thing they're doing to harm their body because they can take the punishment. What what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I I think you you hit it right, the nail right on the head when you said masculine. Not masculine as in gender, but masculine as an archetype, you know, as a way of acting and perceiving and doing and that is this idea of being strong and control of of things i mean the western society is a masculine archetype of a society versus you know a more communal collaborative community which would be more of a feminine style of community much more of, of, of indigenous cultures are more often that way than capitalistic cultures and so there is that component that drives behavior at a subconscious level, I believe. And there are also many industries, whether it's the uh, food industry, the fitness industry, you know, the medical ind- these industries that have secondary gains that exploit, you know, the vulnerabilities of us as individuals um, that are as equally problematic to the what appears to be choices people are making. I don't know that people make choices every day based upon what some believe. Some believe free will is operating all the time. But I think opposite that I think most of our decisions are guided by other processes, uh, different levels of consciousness rather than just pure free will. Right. It's almost as if the marketing structures and the busy lifestyle and the stressful cultural changes and the environmental toxins are all kind of working together and people don't realize that they've been shaped, they've been changed. And I think of um, an easy example of this is anyone who was born um, before the 1990s or maybe before where you grew up without a cell phone or a computer in your hand. And now here we are in 2021 with uh, my cell phone has as much computing power as my laptop and I can communicate with people across the globe. I can read instant news. I can check all mm-hmm. of my, most of my bank accounts or, you know, personal things on my health stats online. And right there is a huge change. And it happened over, I don't know, cell phones, 20, you know, late nineties mm-hmm. uh, till now. So that's a very short time in history for people to adapt. So if all these other changes are going on, such as uh, foods becoming more processed, um, 
people people don't realize what habits they're in. So you do talk about consciousness yeah. and unconsciousness. And I, I know in the counseling industry, we work with people becoming more conscious of the fact that they do have choices every day to make about various things. Um, and just, just like, um, you know, if you think about it this way, people are pretty complex, but plants need a place to grow mm-hmm. and they need water and they need sunlight, right? Most plants, not carnivorous plants. And then you go up to the next level, we have like little dogs and, and other animals and they need kind of like structure and they need uh, food sources and they need companionship because they're in pods or they're in little packs, right? Well, humans, we're all part of the same, uh, you know, part of, we're all part of nature. And so we forget, I think, about these baseline things like, do we get sunshine or are we in our office all day on our computer? Are we drinking water? Or are we drinking some sort of processed mm-hmm. sugar drink? Um, are we having structure where we have exercise and move around? Are we ha- not, are we sleeping? Are these like basic mm-hmm. things that get missed because of whatever story we're telling ourselves? The right. deadlines, uh, something I've got to do, something I should do, something everyone else is doing that I'm not doing. Um, these sort of narratives we get into, and some of that is fueled by ourselves, but some of it's fueled purely by marketing. Mm-hmm. I had a client once tell me, he said. You know, I know that you've worked with people with drug and alcohol addictions, and I don't drink or smoke, but I'm addicted to fast food. And he goes, it's, he says he feels like it's worse because his drug dealer is legal and they're on every corner. And he suffered multiple mm-hmm. health problems because of his fast food addiction. So it, it's interesting, you know, and, that, and of course, that's not demonized. That's seen as right. convenient, helping him get to work faster. Um, and, you know, uh, but eventually killing him, you know, getting worse and worse health wise because of this uh, versus, you know, the drugs, which are also, you know, yeah, yeah. justifiably demonized, but in the alleys. So uh, can you talk a little bit about that and how, how does that impact the way you work with clients? Yeah, yeah there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, um, but I, I try to try to keep things simple, okay. you know, so, um, you know, there's, we really have two ways of of interacting or or uh, that dictate our behaviors. Uh, one is reactive, where we're kind of an autopilot and we're just doing things because that's what we do, you know. And the other is responding, and that's when you have choice. And so, when you're looking at behaviors and patterns of behaviors, I think you have to look at what's the driving mechanism. Is it a reactivity response or is it an intended response and and when we're living in a period of rapid change we're often you know living in an um era where our amygdala you know our fight and flight control center is in hyperactive mode and is very incoherent if you will with the heart rhythms of of our electrical heart rhythms and and that leads us to responding in a very uh, reactive way where we don't seem to have choice, you know. And yet, you know, there are practices and therapies and, and other avenues to help people get out of that place and into a place where, you know, in the moment-to-moment awareness, they can choose to respond differently. There's always going to be a choice for a reaction. And so that's that's the art of medicine is helping people navigate that realm of life. It's easy to prescribe medications and do procedures, but to try to get someone to self-empowered enough and reflective enough to realize that they actually are in much more control of their health and disease process than the medical profession is a real triumph if you can get there. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I think, I don't know what this is from, but sort of like folklore around doctors knowing everything mm-hmm. and that they they do know a lot more than the general public, right? Yeah, yeah. But the things that the doctors could em- empower patients to know, they don't have as much time to tell them right, because... Right they're busy fighting their disease. They're busy prescribing to help them alleviate symptoms or right. stay alive right. and put them on a statin, right? So right. they don't have a, another heart incident. Right. So how do, uh, tell me a little bit about, um, 
you mentioned heart rate variability, I believe. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how do we how do we deal with that? How do we learn yeah. to have better heart rate variability? What is that? Yeah, so heart rate variability is the beat to beat variation that one has in their heart rhythm, you know, and it can be hundreds of a microsecond difference. So it's not something when you look at a electrocardiogram and you look at somebody in a normal rhythm, the beats look equally spaced. But if you got your calipers out and measured that in millimeters, you'd find that each beat has a slight variation from one beat to the next. Uh, that's different than, say, an irregular rhythm like atrial fibrillation, which has a lot of heart rate variability just because it's no longer in a normal rhythm. But there have been many decades worth of research looking at heart rate variability as one of the um, best predictors of uh, premature mortality. So the the less heart rate variability you have, the higher your risk of cardiovascular disease and premature mortality. It's reflective in the fact that when you're in a stress response and your autonomic nervous system is firing in a stress mode, producing lots of adrenaline, that the heart rate variability goes down. At the same time, as we all know, when you're in a stress response mode, you're in a very reactive mode. You're in the fight, flight, or flee, or faint response mode, and you're not intended to be thinking and contemplating what to do next because it's usually a life-threatening situation. Unfortunately for many of us, the rate of change that we're experiencing in many different domains in our life have contributed to us to being in that state chronically. As a result of that, heart rate variability goes down and uh, the, the risk for heart disease is going up. So the Institute of Heart Math has been studying this for several decades now and uh, biofeedback techniques and other resources available to people to kind of self-monitor their own heart rate variability in a way that can help them better manage their stress. The theory that they've uh, created was that there is an energetic heart and it's there's... Uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation from the heart that can extend about five feet outside of your body. It's the strongest electromagnetic field in the body, more so than the brain. And the theory that they're trying to uh, prove is that it controls brain activity. It can control, in terms of a, a certain frequency domain in the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. And so the feedback in the relaxation, heart-centered relaxation techniques, they do show an increase in coherence, meaning that you have entrapment or entrainment of the autonomic nervous system, the endocrine system, all these what they're called oscillating systems, systems that have an inherent frequency to them. It gets a little technical because, again, everything in our body functions at a resonant way. It has a frequency. And so if you can get these frequencies to be much more uh, synchronized, you are actually in a state of better health, both mentally, emotionally, and physically, and potentially even spiritually. That's the theory that HeartMath is working with, and their techniques are used and available to the public to, to practice and play with. Yeah, I understand that HeartMath had developed some computer and phone applications mm -hmm. where you could actually monitor your pulse mm -hmm. and breathe naturally and eventually see if you can get to a, like what they call a coherence mm -hmm. of heart rate variability yeah. where things are differing. Yeah. And I did actually play with that program. And what I found was it was similar to mindfulness meditation, mm -hmm. but it was basically just me focusing on my breathing mm -hmm. and trying to not do anything, trying to not try. And eventually it made a lot of good noises and I was like, oh, I think this is like a fun video game. I'm I'm getting more heart rate coherence here. Um, but the investment was time and space to actually take 15 minutes to play with this program they made and this uh, heart rate monitor. Yeah, another beauty thing, and, and it does. And it, it, so it is, it's a technique, mm -hmm. much like other biofeedback techniques are available as well. You know, but it's what I found for myself when I used it was I was already starting to do a regular mindfulness meditation practice. And I thought I was coming, doing pretty well, sitting 20, 30 minutes at a time without any major challenges other than knowing how the practice works and how you have to come back to your, your mindfulness um, uh, process. But it was heart math in this idea of really 
sensing into what appreciation, love, joy, gratitude feels like in your body in a heart-focused way by recalling a time or an experience in your life or a person, Pat, whatever, that brings one of those emotional states, appreciation, love, joy, gratitude to mind, and then really beginning to experience in a heart-centered way and what that visceral sense of those emotions are. I found that I got into a deeper state of meditation and what I may have been doing, I was doing during regular meditation was just dissociating. Oh, you know, going into Nana land, you know, and, um, and so it really allowed me to become much more viscerally aware of the emotional capacity within the body that, you know, I think we as men often are raised in a specific way to kind of deconstruct that or detach from that. And so, uh, that was the most powerful thing I uncovered with heart math techniques was that re capturing of that aspect of heart awareness being in the love joy appreciation and gratitude yeah it reminds me of some of the research on um, mindfulness-based stress reduction that talked about how if people were able to get into a state of you know doing this mindfulness activity for 25 minutes all of a sudden their creativity uh, thoughts return, their emotional well-being increases, different things like mm-hmm. that. So let's talk a little bit about that and how um, how often or, you know, what do you see with, with, with people who have health problems also having emotional unmet needs mm-hmm. or, or issues? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's always hard uh, to kind of look at cause and effect for sure. But we do know that most cardiovascular disease has an emotional con- contribution. Um, perhaps its greatest data, and I, th- I still think this is so under-recognized, is the adverse childhood experiences. You know, as you know as a therapist, I mean, the first 10 years of life really set up coping strategies into adulthood and 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 lead to addictions and other things. And so these traumas and and experiences of family disruption or neglect or unintended abandonment, you know, all these things, you know, in modern society are fairly prevalent because of the demands that our I would say unhealthy society is placing upon or expecting of families today compared to a hundred years ago and the the different demands. And, and so again, the rate of change that people are experiencing is unprecedented. And so I think children raised today are raised in a completely different way than they were generations ago where you actually had, you know, a parent at home, not saying that that's the best circumstance for all families, but it, it certainly did change the characteristics of the nuclear family and in the lack of a mentoring, a truly emotionally mentoring individual at home has become less prevalent as we delegate those services to third parties like, you know, daycare and other things where many of these uh, educators, if you want to call them educators or sitters are not even trained in psychosocial development. You know, uh, that's kind of, that to me is a scary thing, but it's a very, common um, experience for many families across America. Right. And that is often driven almost, in my opinion, a little bit more by the market circumstances yeah. than, it, uh, than it is cultural. Yeah. Uh, but then the market becomes the culture. Mm-hmm. And um, what we've seen uh, with low income families is um, both parents working and the the kids either are at some sort of state funded daycare or they are at the grandparents if they exist or aunts and uncles houses sort of mm-hmm. with all the other kids from the low income families and uh in those circumstances without well resourced um i don't know programs for them to be in there often are not good coping skills getting passed down and what right. i mean by that not good would be i'm judging but i think you know eating 
processed food, yeah. drinking sugary sodas. I see that as the gateway for later drug addiction yeah. um, or alcoholism. Not always, but yeah. um, you know, in the adverse child experiences study, when you had all these, and this is just from trauma. I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't even talking about trauma. I'm just talking about socialization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if you had a certain amount of traumas in the adverse child experiences study, you had a greater chance of obesity, a greater chance of drug addiction, a greater chance of having a sexually transmitted disease, a greater chance of having a smoking uh, cigarette habit. Um, so many of uh, just greater chance of mortality in general, greater chance of domestic violence. Um, and, that was with the traumas. Yeah. Go ahead. And, and it is uh, a, a, having more, four or more of those factors was a greater predictor of cardiovascular disease than traditional risk factors. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Did not know that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I, I, maybe I did, but I, I forgot. Um, so if we're talking about traumas, I mean, that's huge. And what the cool, well, interesting, we'll go into this for a second, just for people that don't know about the Adverse Child Experiences Study. The interesting thing about the Adverse Child Experiences Study was that I was talking about low-income people in the, and, and having those less resources and those mm-hmm. habits, but yeah. that's happening at all socioeconomic levels. Yeah. It's just happening in different ways. But the Adverse Child Experiences Study was actually done on middle and upper middle class individuals mm-hmm. who... And it kind of tore the mask off of this idyllic childhood fantasy that we've sort of cultivated in some sort of wing of our culture here. And um, and people were reporting, you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, spiritual abuse, you know, through uh, clergy at church uh, or, or whatever, synagogues. And um, just all sorts of things. And the researchers at Kaiser Permanente in, in San Diego were just astounded by what yeah. they were seeing because they had they had predicted, I mean, their prediction rates were so off yeah. about how many uh, of these incidents were going to be reported. And then they followed these individuals for years and sort of had health outcomes. And it's it's morphed into larger and, uh, and other studies as well. Yeah. Um, but it's it's a pretty accurate yeah, and Study. not all these uh, experiences are traumatic in terms of like a PTSD like trauma. Oh, right. mm-hmm. So they're uh, they're and, and many of them are not intentional. That's just the the dynamics of what these kids were placed into during their their rearing stages. And and again, uh, maybe mostly that the you know families had disruptive environments for a variety of reasons. But the 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 biggest a challenge for them was that they did not have the resourceful person that could help them integrate their emotional experience, you know, in a way that um, allowed them to process that in a holistic way. That's from a, a mental, emotional, and physical way. You know, um, not telling them how what their emotions are for sure, but but how to just process and be aware, nurture, support in a loving way. Um, that they could heal from and rather than suppress it and learn to repress it for later aspects in life so they didn't re-experience those symptoms, those feelings. And that's where we run into problem with the childhood adverse experiences. Even if it's not a major event, it could be just the fact that mom wasn't there or dad wasn't there, you know, or available, you know, to a crying child regularly, you know. And, um, and so th- that child then develops processes and coping strategies that then lead to, or like we talked about earlier, addiction and other things. And with the adverse childhood experiences, I think the first group that they really identified that was is 80%, I think it was around 80% of the obese individuals, it's through an obesity clinic that was started, the study was started in, 80% had four or more adverse childhood mm. experiences. Mm-hmm. And, and these are women, mostly women, who had challenges with weight loss reduction programs. Right. And I think some of the questions were just something like, did a member of your family si- experience like significant financial yeah. issues? Yeah. Or, and, and the parents would say that around the children and be stressed out about it. Yeah. I mean, just even that. Divorce, separation, right. incarceration, mm-hmm. drug, alcohol use in the family, you know, all of those were part of the questionnaire. So not just physical, sexual, emotional abuse. Right. And so it's, um, well, in the mental health field, we're quite aware of, and, uh, and we read a lot about studies about how if you can help somebody 
move through depression or or recover from a major anxiety episode or or work through the post traumatic stress disorder or deal with an adjustment mm-hmm. you know an adjustment uh, meaning that you move or something big happens a divorce or um you know, a challenge at work or something large happens and you have a huge disruption in your life. If you can help them move through that, but then help them move further to a place where they're actually doing preventative Mm -hmm. mental health practices, um, the data is still coming in, but it seems that they then often start taking care of their physical health better. Right. Um, Yeah. And I think that's, that's a key to healing. You know, uh, and that's part of the self care. You know, when when I mention self care, it's easy. Well, I, I have to eat better, exercise more, sleep better. No, you have to take care of yourself. You know, you have to have time alone to reflect, meditate, manage your own personal inner self, as well as being outside, enjoying nature, connecting with nature, connecting with humans without being plugged in all the time. You know, uh, there's a, there's a lot of different facets to that. In the integrative medicine model, what we try to do with that sense of healing is recognize that we as well-trained, educated individuals are not the authority over your body or your mind. You are your own authority, you know, but we're here to support you and to advocate for you in terms of understanding how health is created and diseases are you know prevented and reversed you know through the use of modern medicines use of complementary alternative medicine modalities uh, appropriate lifestyle modification and then you know integration of emotional and um, emotional wounds you know over time you know and and so in an integrative medicine model we often talk about a pluralistic multidisciplinary approach to self and that is pluralistic meaning that we will use different um resources you know it could be nutrition it could be mind body medicine it could be uh, manual medicine it could be conventional medicine herbal medicine naturopathic medicine with a multidisciplinary team of providers who have different perspectives on healing so that we can match the individual with the best healer to meet their needs, you know, and align those perspectives. We talked about coherence. There's so much already written about coherence between a patient and provider as perhaps the most um, prominent source of healing. In fact, Wayne Jonas is an integrative medicine physician who's done a lot of placebo work and other work, and uh, he commonly uh, reports that if you look at the outcomes of a medical intervention, less than 20% of that outcome is due to the medical intervention. Over 80% is due to other factors, such as the interaction between provider and client or patient, placebo effect versus nocebo effect, all these other things that play a role. That, and that to me, that's fascinating. That's what drew me to the integrative medicine model because it really explores that 80% more than the 20%, but does not deny the benefit of that 20% of the medical intervention. Yes, and that is a very tricky thing to try to put value on, Mm -hmm. because I think that there's a competing value system Mm -hmm. in the market, and that is you have to pay rent. You have to buy supplies. You have to pay your administrative staff. You've got to wrangle insurance companies. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to market yourself unless you work for a giant company. And if you work, but so let's just say you're independent, then you have to see as many patients as possible Mm -hmm. to make all the overhead and pay yourself. Now, if you work for a giant medical system, then they're going to want you to be at a level of, quote, productivity. Right. And they're measuring productivity by a number of build units, which means usually interventions right um in and these incentives may actually be going against the research that we've just talked about yeah yeah um which is that giving the the person more time with the doctor um 
getting an integrative team going who pays for the fact that the team needs to talk and share files um, and making a plan that's holistic for that person. And maybe that person's learning style is different than another patient's learning style. And how how do we, how do we deal with that? Um, The research is also completely in line with the research in in psychotherapy, which actually um, according to, multiple studies called the common factor studies and scott miller was involved in this phd and among others found that their their estimates are 90 percent of psychotherapy is the relationship between the client and the patient the other two aspects of that are the fact that the patient and the, uh, the the therapist can explain to the patient what interventions they're going to use and the value of them and the patient believes right that this is actually going to be useful for them and that the therapist, the therapist believes that the patient can get better. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Those that's 90% yeah. and then 10% would be the actual modality. Yeah. I think we see that same process, you know, I mean, two things come to mind through that, you know, I do believe there's incredible power, power, powerful healing with allowing patients to be seen, heard and appreciated. Mm-hmm. I think that's what they're all yearning for, even though they may not voice that. Yeah, they want to be fixed, too. But Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's all about being seen, heard, and appreciated. So they listen to their story. But even in medicine, you know, we have this idea of complementary alternative medicine and then allopathic medicine. And if you look at, and I've had uh, about 10 years worth of experience working now within the complementary alternative medicine field with different practices and different practice arrangements and different providers. In the vast majority of these practices, whether they're naturopathic physicians, integrative medicine physicians, or functional medicine physicians, the vast majority of them are spending more time with patients per visit than the conventional practice, than what the conventional practice has become. Not saying that that's not evolving, because that is evolving, but as a way most people perceive the conventional practice is a 20-minute visit, you know, sign off on the signatures uh, for prescriptions and out the door you go as a patient, right? So in the unconventional practices, you know, as you alluded to, there's the idea of trust between the provider and the patient, the idea of being heard and listened to and appreciated, and then understanding the choices and understanding the passion behind the intervention being offered, those are all pretty incredibly powerful things. I brought up the term nocebo. The, one of the problems with conventional medicine is that we have to disclose adverse events that might be associated with a particular intervention. We talked about statins, or you mentioned statins earlier. There's, there's these now new trials that are called N equals 1 trial where you use yourself as a control. Hmm. And, and they did studies where they looked at you know, Lipitor versus placebo versus no drug in patients that had muscle aches with the statins. And, and so they, they had recruited these patients, they took them off, washed out the drug, and then they randomized them to no drug, placebo, or the Lipitor. I use Lipitor as a generic name, a statin. And patients could not differentiate. They had their muscle pain regardless of whether they were taking placebo or the statin, and they didn't have it when they were taking the non-drug arm. Okay. Equal amounts. Mm -hmm. And so that's the nocebo effect. In other Mm -hmm. words, they anticipate they're going to have pain, or the belief is that there's pain related to that intervention, and it occurs. Wow. Whereas um, we could get into a lot of different therapies that are prevalent right now with COVID, but you know a lot of the treatments that are being offered, say as an alternative to, co- uh, to as an alternative treatment for prevention and treatment of COVID, right now are coming at the s- in same direction. In other words, they're being offered as a service with very low toxicity and and a very beneficial response. Um, yet the, there's no very few randomized controlled trials that show benefit. So when you offer the the plus to a selective group of people who have already 
developed a belief system around that way of treating, there is going to be a huge placebo response, or often referred to in academia as enhanced placebo reaction. And, and that's not a bad thing, as long as there's no toxicity behind that, or there's no other kind of um, unintended, or intended, I should say, uh, processes involved in those decision making, such as profits and right. other things that have become prevalent in many different markets in healthcare. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Um, I know you aren't fully naming those treatments just because yeah, that might be yeah, a whole yeah, other yeah, yeah, ball a, of wax, yeah. but um, it does remind me of the study that the, I think there's a Harvard Department of Placebo Studies now. Mm-hmm, I don't mm-hmm, know if yeah. you about the study, and I've quoted this study before, so the listeners will have to forgive me, but with the uh, the knee surgeries. Yeah, the sham knee surgeries. Right. They yeah. did the fake knee surgeries and the real knee surgeries, and the people with the fake knee surgeries recovered faster, quote-unquote, because they were doing all the physical therapy that was prescribed as the six-week post-care or whatever, yeah. post-op requirement and the people that had had the real knee surgeries were having so many problems with yeah. pain because they had, had they had had their knees cut into and really what it was is they probably had needed most of them not all of them yeah. a, 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 the, the percentages obviously there's some people with complete you know bone problems or right. whatever but the percentage was that like the the largest percentage of them actually probably just needed to move around and have physical yeah. therapy <laughs> yeah not have surgery so and i know you've I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Sarno and the the uh, the unnecessary back surgery studies. Yeah, not that one. I, the one from cardiology is pacemakers. Okay. Yeah, and for people who have um, uh, vasodepressor syncope, you know, um, who's who who pass out, you know, and right. uh, and they actually did a study where they put the pacemakers in, but some of them weren't programmed to be active, and some were programmed to be active in a randomized way. And that led to a, a huge change in behavior because they found that the pacemaker didn't protect the patient. Mm. Whereas at a time before that trial, patients were routinely getting pacemakers for this particular phenomenon called uh, vasodepressor syncope. And uh, now we know that very few, there are responders that do need the pacemaker, but clearly there was an excess number of pacemakers being put in with the belief that it was helping. But when they did the, the sham operation... There was no benefit. Wow. So <laughs> there's a lot to this that gets complicated. Yeah, so yeah. I want to. I, I I think there's a lot of studying people can do on yeah, these sort of yeah. things. I want to. I want to make sure we get back a little bit to um, a little bit what, about what you're doing now yeah. and with your the integrative cardiovascular medicine. What I understand now is you've. You are a, a owner and starter of a clinic called Integrative Wellness Grand Rapids, where you are um, supervising some other doctors and um, integrative practitioners yeah. yes. um, to work together as a team. Can you tell me a little bit about that and your yeah. approach? Yeah, yeah. So, um, again, my observation has been that there is an increasing demand for additional complementary services to the allopathic conventional healthcare system. People just are not getting all their um, answers through that system. And, um, and especially with the extent of media coverage from A to Z and beyond in terms of ideas of how people can heal, you know, people are much more loaded with information about, you know, well, what does this really mean to me? And what else can I do for, to restore my health and well-being? And so I've taken that upon him as a cardiologist to become a, an educator and an advocate for individuals uh, as a kind of struggle with either their risk for heart disease or their actual heart disease that may be already there. And helping them understand why their doctors are choosing certain therapies and how they work. So I do a ton of education. And then I also don't diminish or um, um, or dismiss, you know, other modalities of healing, you know, and, and if, if they're interested in exploring that, I'm open to exploring that with them in a kind of a, a doctor-patient guided format, if you will. Um, at the end of the day, so much of what I do is lifestyle medicine and helping people learn how to eat healthier and 
and what does that really mean, you know, and become more active and manage stress and get better sleep and getting outdoors and, and, um, you know, having healthy relationships. Cause at the end of the day, that's what makes life beautiful is, is those aspects of our life. And, and, um, and so that's, that's what I do as an integrative cardiologist. I don't any longer take care of hospitalized patients. You know, I work, I tell patients I work on their behalf as an extension to their conventional healthcare services. And so we're working on to try to create a, this more integrative phenomenon where your doctor is no longer the authoritarian. You know, he's your the source of information and your advocate on this journey to health and well-being. And that's kind of the the, the main mission of this new practice. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much a fan of that because it's like this team approach. Mm -hmm. And I think having the knowledge that you have combining with the other doctors and their knowledge can really give the person multiple other perspectives mm -hmm. while complementing maybe other things they're involved in. And um, I was so glad that we were able to, at Health for Life Grand Rapids, Health for Life Counseling Grand Rapids, we were able to share a little space yeah. uh, right now as the clinic is, is growing um, in demand. Uh, so it's, it's pretty fun for us therapists to have some doctors in the house that we can ask questions to yeah. and, and collaborate with, perhaps. Yeah, and it works both ways because as we talked in the main segment of this uh, podcast about is, you know, mental health is a big component of cardiovascular fitness, you know, if you will. And, and so not only can we provide resources to your patients, but you offer the tremendous amount of, um, of resources to the patients that we see that are willing and able or wanting or understand that aspect of their life is contributing. And I'm going to emphasize is contributing um, to their, their cardiovascular fitness, if you will. Yeah. And I think it's, it's so interesting how, you know, just learning from you during this talk about, I, I mean, I knew some of these things, but how, how much of your cardiovascular health can be influenced by emotional and social yeah. factors. I mean, I, I knew about, you know, not eating red meat every day or things like yeah. that, that you read on WebMD, but I didn't know about how much that can, the stress mm -hmm. uh, and not managing stress can lead to the chronic cardiovascular issues. So I think that's a, that's an issue we're seeing in, in the mental health world right now is that there's a couple of factors. Well, there's many factors, but here's two main factors. When stress is high and isolation is high, every sort of symptom that a client could could have in any sort of former diagnosis that they had before or sort of, sort of a chronic go ongoing diagnosis, uh, everything just gets worse. Okay. So where something might have been like a minor anxiety before that wouldn't even maybe register on a doctor's chart yeah. is now with how things have been going since probably the last five years in our society – has turned and morphed into a full-blown um, daily uh, problem that's debilitating their ability to have relationships, do well at work, manage mm -hmm. their life, um, and that's just probably from stress. And then, and then the the isolation factor of of what has happened with the pandemic has led to a lot of just problems that are still coming out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. Not only social problems with yeah. children. Uh, but just your average person um, finding themselves more depressed or anxious because they don't have that social connection. Right. And while the Internet has helped, you know, bring people together in some ways, it certainly isn't, I don't think, making up for the more natural right. gatherings. Right. Um, that because you can f there's a difference in feeling that people report. Yeah. Um, although better than nothing. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. And social determinants of health. I mean, the World Health Organization recognizes that that's the primary cause of chronic disease, you know, and, and uh, whether it's socioeconomic status, whether it's isolation, whether it's uh, poor education or lack of health care access, all of these factors. At the end of the day, it's interesting how we still lump, you know, in the post 
Rene Descartes, the Cartesian world that we live in, where we separate mind and body, you know, many of us are recognizing there is no separation of mind and body. You know, they're pretty much one of the same thing. And similarly, I would like to say at some point we get to the same way with mental health versus physical health. Mm, yes. Because it's just health. And they're intimately engaged in conversation in a two-way streak. And and when we start to do that and then start to deal with the social determinants of health in a society that has growing segregation, growing divisiveness, growing socioeconomic disparities, you know, you know, we're right picking for continued escalation of chronic disease and continued infiltration of opportunistic infections and what have you, because that's, that's the, I mean, it's a social determinant of health that's really disrupting our resiliency. And in, until we can figure out how to engage that and create a more I hate to use the term egalitarian world. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, we're kind of stuck in a paradigm that, uh, you know, uh, even though I got out of conventional medicine because I got tired of just putting Band-Aids on, I still feel like I'm putting Band-Aids on when I even take this holistic model because there's so much. It's almost very Sisyphean. In other words, and trying to push that boulder up over the mountaintop and it just keeps rolling back down because there's so much out there fighting that change to add resilience to a, the human species. But if you ask me at the end of the day, what keeps me going, it's the people who really get it and they make steps for, on, for themselves. And you just watch that transformation. You see it as a therapist when they wake up and that light comes on and there's a new glimmer in their eye. There's new hope, you know, you know, for what's, what tomorrow brings. There's new excitement, new passion. Those are the things that really get me turned on about medicine is when you see that evolve with our clients. It's so much more important than what I prescribe, you know, on a piece of paper or now through an electronic health format, you know, um, uh, and so much more rewarding. Yeah, and I think that is important for all the clinicians out there listening to remember um, there are a lot of good stories that we have hopefully in our wheelhouse yeah. where people have been able to make the changes and graduate therapy. Maybe they're only coming to you once a year to check in, yeah. um, sending us an email or a postcard instead of, you know, coming in every week and, uh, you know, having chronic ailments. And so I think that's important to remember because that is a ripple effect yeah. because those, those individuals and families that, that find these healthier preventative practices and, and implement them, mm -hmm. that's a that's an influencer on yeah. other people they might run into. Yeah, and so true. And 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 I think the systems are getting it. You know, I mean the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, American Diabetic Association, all these major healthcare um, organizations are now, for instance, embracing a, a shift towards a more whole food plant based diet as a way to maintain and restore health. I mean, that's, that's relatively new, you know, American uh, Heart Association now really is promoting research and um, information to providers about the value of both emotional and behavioral health and its influence on cardiovascular disease. So a lot of the topics that we are talking about, you know, are evolving and the interest is gaining momentum. And alongside that, you now start to hear words like value-based health care you know, which will be a similar format that involves how do we get people to heal rather than just treat based upon a, you know, ICD diagnosis and you've got a certain set of recommended interventions. That's not healing, that's treating. And then we're going to shift into a healing environment. And I, the systems, you know, move at a very slow pace because it's, there's big systems with a lot of inertia. And and so, but it is happening. And uh, you look at Spectrum Health now that has their own lifestyle medicine program, you know, and they're uh, regularly, you know, have, or prior to COVID, regular, you know, sessions on teaching people how to eat whole food, plant-based, you know, meal plans. You know, so that is in the systems. Um, it trickles down to the day-to-day -day providers over time. And I'm very optimistic that that will continue because it's on high demand now with, uh, within our culture, you know, um, 
And so I'm excited about what we have to offer. And, uh, you know, I agree with you. It, it would make my day if I just got a card saying, I, you wouldn't believe how I feel now. You know, I don't have to come back to see you anymore because I've achieved this success, you know, um, and I feel well and things are gone and my scores, X, Y, or Z, whatever test have improved. Those are, those are incredibly rewarding, you know, much more so than having to, you know, manage people and their ailments day in and day out. That's important to do because a lot of people don't know or recognize how to make a change or they just don't have the willpower or whatever it is. You know, they just can't make the change and they're going to be in need of providers who can provide those proven efficacious therapies to, to keep them to their state of wellness that they're currently in, you know. But there are, as you know, growing numbers of patients and people in the population who are exploring health rather than disease. And again, that's the niche that we tend to fall and fill. Yes, I think there's a greater demand for it. And I think it it depends also sort of where you're living and what's being influenced. And I know um, in Arizona, I was talking about this earlier, not that it's everywhere in Arizona, but maybe in the circles I hang out in, it's popular and and uh, sort of the trend to be healthy, to eat healthy foods, and to show that you're eating healthy foods, and that you're not drinking too much or whatever. Yeah. And then here in Michigan, uh, we're Beer City, USA, yeah. and yeah. Grand Rapids, and there is an emphasis on our great baked goods and our deer meat and our beer and and our cheese and all these sort of things and it's it's just interesting and not that say those things are bad it's just that if you eat them all day every day they will have health effects that are well documented um and so i was just it's just interesting but even here in michigan how people are looking for something and i think there is a void in the market um because uh, to to get a real integrative practice going takes time patience uh and patience of course but patience is a huge Mm -hmm. thing i think that there's these quick fixes you know people have seen weight loss clinics where like drink this shake and stop eating chips and all right come back next week and and that's all right you know some works for some people but i think you know finding helping educate the person to be able to really understand it in a simplistic way because here's Mm -hmm. the hard part we know this we read scientific studies and it takes us a little while to digest them, but to be able to, to regurgitate that to a client in a way or a patient in a way that is understandable and uh, applicable to their lives is a very difficult <laughs> undertaking. Mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. It, yeah. And it, yeah, it is, it is a challenge in the state of Michigan. I was one of the first um, integrative, formerly trained integrative medicine physicians in the state, you know, and especially as a cardiologist, I'm the only cardiologist that's formally trained in integrative medicine. Um, and so, whereas in California and New Mexico and Arizona and out east, there's a fair number of people engaged in the process. You know, it is what it is, but it, you know, if people ask me uh, routinely, you know, why I'm not, not in the insurance industry based healthcare system doing the same thing, and we talked about that earlier. A first, first, you know, Medicare, for instance, does not recognize integrative medicine consultative services it's just not a billable code that you can use and and there is no icd code for health and wellness it's only disease specific and so when you're trying to create health and wellness you can't really code for that and that's what you're spending your time doing and so we've opted to be outside the insurance model you know so that we can free ourselves of some of the restrictive processes that are uh, required in those um, entities in terms of uh, diagnostic codes and what have you um, because our concept is much more broad than what that industry provides. And, and so um, that's how we've kind of continued to evolve for now. And that's, as you, as you know, having been in Arizona, that's how a large number of them are operating in Arizona. Although, you know, there is increasing numbers of the West coast practices becoming insurance based. Um, But again, when you're trying to, spend the time with individuals to get the deep healing, you know, just by listening. You don't have to be a therapist. It's important to have therapists available, but so many patients just benefit from having their story told, you know, in a way that was authentically listened to. 
and heard and appreciated. That by far is so much more healing. And maybe a story that they don't even know is there, you know. But if you give them the time and the space, what we often refer in the therapeutic model as the sacred space, you know, where they feel comfortable and secure to kind of explore what's happened in their lives and what what's behind. I, I don't like the term root cause because it's a little bit redundant. Because root is a cause, you know. <laughs> but anyway, it, when you really get to that point of exploring that, you'll for most of us, you'll find that there are um, other aspects of our lives that we weren't aware of. You know, many people are, but there are a lot of people that aren't because of our ability to repress and suppress our emotions and our experiences that have been adversely um, um, experienced. And and so, again, that's that's one of the things I liked about this space as well, is to be able to have access to providers who are not only trauma-informed, you know, but also behavioral mental health experts as well to help me and my team, if you will, my team and I you know, uh, have a more comprehensive treatment strategy, you know, for our patients as they come in. Um, yeah, I just think uh, there's so much more to be done than just identifying and treating. You know, one of my colleagues is, you know, uh, uh, uses the phrase test, don't guess. Well, a test is just a small window. You know, it's like a pixel on a big screen of what's actually going on in that screen. And, and so, yeah, it might give you a clue as to one element of your physical body, but it's not the entirety of the picture. And so we like to take a much broader perspective than that. It's not that I don't test. And I think tests do wonderful jobs of helping people understand what's happening in their body. Um, but it's not the end game, you know, and the treatment's not that the, the medicinal treatments aren't the end game, whether it's a supplement, drug, prescription, surgery, intervention, the treatment is really getting the individual engaged and empowered to be in, in control of their health and well-being at the end of the day, rather than become victimized and stuck in that victim loop uh, that so often gets achieved by a diagnosis. And I think that's a, a really good place for kind of our conclusion here is that I think we want to shift people in the community from feeling like a victim to their health ailments to feeling like they're empowered and they've got the tools necessary and the education, which isn't, I mean, you don't have to go to medical school to learn these things that you're trying to help clients right. with or patients with. Um, help them be able to become empowered and take small steps towards health. And that's where the clinicians come in. That's where the doctors come in as, as a guide, as a helper, to help them actually take more ownership and control of their health instead of, you know, seeing it as some sort of fate. Yeah. I guess I'm just fate. My parents were this way, so I guess I'm going to be diabetic type 2 as well. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of seeing it that way, seeing it like, what who, what do I want to be like? How, how do I, how do, what, what shape do I want to be in? Mm -hmm. How, how do I want to respond mentally uh, and emotionally to adversity? And starting to work on a plan with a practitioner, whether it be right. a therapist or a doctor, and you'll be surprised at, I think almost everyone is surprised who, who finds a good doctor or a good therapist at, at how things change over time. But most oftentimes, the same people are also, you know, stuck in a rut, so to speak, and and and, at, and before they get engaged, and even in the first couple of appointments, may not believe that it's possible for them, which yeah. is a whole problem. But if they're listening to this, hopefully a, a, a client or a patient uh, who will understand that it does take engagement, and yeah. it takes engagement with the right doctor or therapist for you, and that changes over time as well, yeah. but... That's the first step is finding somebody you believe believes in you and right. believes in seeing you the way you'd want to be instead of the way you are right now. Yeah, and, and that, that's a, a yeah, good thing to recognize is that, yeah, we are constantly changing. And, and even our own individual perspectives of what's happening in our life today is so different than 20 years ago because of our own maturation, our own increase in wisdom and experience and things are 
perspectives are always changing. And, and so, you know, capitalizing on that in a way that's beneficial to an individual so that they can recognize that change is inevitable and that, you know, they're in complete control of, I don't want to say complete control, but they're in control of that, that change process of their body and their mind, you know, again, which I often would say their body mind is one thing, but, you know, it's so empowering just to get people to begin to recognize how important, you know, a good, healthy lifestyle can be and, 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 and how unhealthy our social norms have created an unhealthy lifestyle, you know, from a sedentary lifestyle to uh, industrialized diet, you know, to uh, poor sleep and, you know, ex- extensive entertainment that's keeping us up you know, 24 seven, you know, um, I like to use the term entertainment because that's what most of eating, playing, screening is, is it's pure entertainment. It can be addiction, but it's entertainment to addiction, uh, or addiction to entertainment. But at the end of the day, I think you're right. Recognizing change. We are always changing and, and, and having somebody support you through that process and, um, is, is vital to, uh, health and recovery, you know, um, but it, uh, uh, the other thing I'd often kind of share with people is it's like so many times we we stumble. I use the term Sisyphean, like you know, Sisyphus was pushing the boulder over the rock, and Hades banished him, and the rock kept falling down. He couldn't get the rock over the mountain, so he was that was his banishment. You know, uh, so much of our life we kind of feel stuck. You know, yet. You know, if we're able to take the time and willing to change some of our perspective, some of our story, we can, you know, change that narrative in a way that can become more healing rather than keeping us, you know, fragmented and isolated and um, in a certain state that may predispose us, if not contributing to active disease. That was a lot of rambling, I know. No, that's great. That's great. <laughs> I think that's the those are some very wise guidelines that you provided throughout. Yeah. But yeah, trying to remove obstacles. That's what I was trying to get at was the obstacles to healing. And and we want to help people, you know, recognize that there are certain things that they're getting stuck with or tripping over all the time that they might be they may not be consciously aware of. And again, there are ways that we interview people, you know, and some people might call it motivational interviewing techniques, for instance, that help people identify and uncover those obstacles so that they can create their own solutions without me prescribing it, that actually have much more value at the end of the day than what I prescribe. We all know that we learn more from our mistakes than our, our you know, our correct behaviors, you know, um, and so, um, yeah, that's that's one of the values of the integrative medicine model is it really focuses on that level of empowerment to overcome those obstacles to healing. Well, I like that a lot, and I'm really glad that you were able to come by and share about what you're doing as an integrative physician and as a person who is now... Uh, running this new clinic, Integrative Wellness Grand Rapids. People can find out about it. I'll have that link in the show notes. And uh, I think I've learned a lot today, and I'm sure our listeners have as well. So I appreciate that, Dave. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. I'm walking home And there you have it. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you are a therapist and are looking to become EMDR trained, I would recommend EMDR Training Solutions. They are an amazing group of people that provide trainings online and eventually in person to help you become EMDR trained and eventually EMDRIA certified. You can use the code INTENTIONAL, that's the word INTENTIONAL, to get $100 off 
if you purchase a training, especially if it's your first training. A little bit about what I've been up to. I am almost a full Emdria consultant, and I can provide consultation hours and have a group going every Wednesday. So let me know if you would like to be a part of that consultation group. Also, I have a course online called What Do We Do Now? for the parents of young adults, which you can find on Udemy. There will be a link in the show notes. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids area at Health for Life Counseling Grand Rapids and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting www.healthforlifegr.com. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guests, and while these are based upon literature they have read, their experience in their respective fields, and personal experiences, these viewpoints should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Line at 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. Are you a young person of color, feeling down, stressed out, or overwhelmed? Text Steve, that's S-T-E-V-E, to 741741, and a live, trained crisis counselor will respond. Did you know you could support your local bookstore by shopping at bookshop.org? You can order online from the comfort of your own home while supporting a local bookstore near you that is brick and mortar. If you are not a member of a mental health Counselors Association, I highly recommend that you join, such as the Michigan Mental Health Counselors Association, which you can find on the internet, or any other state which you live in. There are a lot of things that go into keeping counseling available to the public. So I really encourage you to get involved in your local organization. Until next time, I'm wishing everyone a safe and peaceful week. I've gotten used to Something to hold tightly Something to send off, baby Something to Let be See the moon